closed last time with the story of, of Abraham sending his trusted servant to find a wife for Isaac. And it's a very beautiful story, very meaningful story. The <clears throat> servant is so trusting that the Lord is going to provide, and the Lord does provide. <clears throat> and I like the closing when <clears throat> they're getting uh, Isaac is out in the, in the field. Uh, the text says meditating, but the footnote says we're not sure what this word means. <laughs> anyway, uh, and and uh, he sees the camels, and he, so he's curious what this is. I get, though I presume he knows that Abraham had sent his servant to get him a wife. But anyway, she sees him, and she says to the uh, Abraham servant, Who, "Who's that?" fellow and he says well that is my master and so she puts on her veil mm -hmm. I guess the veiling goes back a long ways It'll, the veiling will come up for more discussion a little bit later but anyway uh, she gets down from the camel and goes to meet him and <clears throat> he takes her home to his mother's tent now his mother has died uh, I'm told in one of my readings that it was a tradition for the marriage to take place at the, in the mother's tent. But anyway, he married Rebecca. She became his wife and he loved her. And Isaac was comforted after his mother's death. Now Isaac, uh, we, there, we don't have quite so many dramatic stories about Isaac, but Isaac is a good guy. Uh, he uh, uh, he's a, a very admirable person for the most part. Now, I want to make a couple of observations as we study Genesis because we're getting into more of these stories that take a little explaining or thinking. First thing is that you don't want to judge the patriarchs and some of the things they do by our standards. They didn't live in Christian society. They didn't have... Uh, the Lord Jesus and uh, the Holy Spirit guiding them and all so forth. So some of the things they did were kind of according to the customs of the day. But the opposite thing to say is this doesn't make these things God's will. Uh, the, the, uh, uh, there are two groups of people that get that kind of confused. One of them is the old Mormons who say they were all polygamists because God intended every man to be a polygamist. I don't think so. <clears throat> uh, Abraham, we'll see, had a, a, a concubine. We'll talk about that. But uh, with Isaac, it was Isaac and Rebecca. Uh, that's all that we're told. And they seem to have a real love story all the way through life. So in chapter 25, we're told that Abraham took another wife whose name was Keturah. And he has, uh, let's see, one, two, three, four, five, six sons uh, from her. And, and there's a connection with some of like the tribe that Moses spent time with, our descendants of, of this, uh, of the line that comes from Abraham and Keturah. Uh, <clears throat> okay. Abraham's 140 years old. It's a little old to be starting a second family, even in his day, I think. <clears throat> so it's possible, since she's called a concubine, that this actually began before Sarah died. But uh, we, wouldn't, we would frown on that, so the translators, <laughs> the writers, don't give us that information at that time. But it's possible. So anyway, uh, uh, it's not impossible that Moses, that Moses, that Abraham had the ability to raise, start another family even at 140 years old, because he lives to be 175. So, okay, Abraham then makes it very clear that Isaac is his one heir as far as God is concerned. And he already has sent Ishmael away, and we'll talk about that a little in this chapter. And now he sends all these children by Keturah away someplace. Uh, and, and all the, the inheritance, especially the inheritance of the covenant with God, is for Isaac alone. <clears throat> so Abraham left everything he owned to Isaac. But while he was still living, he gave gifts to the sons of his concubines. Now it's plural there. It only mentions Keturah, but it's, it's 
Uh, I'm not sure what to make of that. And sent them away from his son Isaac to the land of the east. Now, the land of the east would mean toward uh, Egypt, uh, all this land around the southern part of what of the Holy Land, and that's where we find these people later. <clears throat> so, altogether, Abraham lived 175 years. Then Abraham breathed his last and died as a good at a good old age. I would guess so. An old man full of years, and he was gathered to his people. I've always liked that phrase, though I'm not just sure what they meant by it. Gathered to his people. Uh, it seems to be more than just buried in the family plot, because in Abraham's case, there wasn't a family plot. Uh, Terah wasn't buried there. He didn't go back to be buried next to his father and grandfather. So I'm thinking it's more of a reference to the afterlife. There are those who, among the Jews who argued that there was no uh, sense of an afterlife in the Old Testament, but I don't think they're right. So it may be this gathered to his people <clears throat> is an idea that uh, he, he went where his forefathers had gone. He was gathered to his people. His sons Isaac and Ishmael buried him. I thought this was interesting. Ishmael had been sent away, but he came back hearing that his father died and has respect for his father, even though he's kind of a, a rebel type of guy. Uh, so the two sons at this point uh, buried him and they buried him in that same cave that he bought from the neighbors. Uh, we talked a lot about that last week, so we won't go back over that unless you have some questions. <clears throat> so Abraham was buried along with his wife, Sarah. He had already buried her some 20 years before or more. After Abraham's death, God blessed his son Isaac who then lived near Bir Lahairoi. Bir Lahairoi is down in that wilderness area, and it's kind of strange, so thank you, that, uh, that he with all his herds and flocks and stuff. And at one point it talks about him cultivating land, raising crops, <clears throat> that he would be down that deep into that wilderness area. But apparently, it was, if you had a good well, had water, it was possible to clear ground away and make a good living there, because that seems to be what Isaac is doing. Now this would put him some distance from his father's basic area where he was living. And you can see that, that as he grew up and had his own uh, wife and his own uh, flocks and herds and people, that he would want to move away from his father. Now, <clears throat> then at verse 12, it says, this is the account of Abraham's son Ishmael. There are 11 of these statements in Genesis going way back to the first chapters. This is the account of, or, or uh, however they want to translate it. And there are those who say, well, this, this looks like these were separate documents that were put together to form the book of Genesis. I don't have too much problem with that. Moses had to get his information someplace <clears throat> and you can say, well, the Holy Spirit gave it to him. I think the Holy Spirit guards the word, but I think um, uh, that it wouldn't be unreasonable for him to have documents which the Holy Spirit would substantiate. So anyway, here's this count, a, a brief account of Abraham's son Ishmael, whom Sarah's man, maidservant Hagar the Egyptian bore to Abraham. And I think, um, I think it says earlier that, uh, that Hagar got him a wife from Egypt. So he's, he's partly Abraham, but he's mostly Egyptian. Now, these are the names of his sons and the names are listed there. My footnote notes that these names are more Arab-like and, and that it substantiates what the Muslims claimed was that they were descendants the Arab peoples were descendants of Ishmael. So, uh, and interestingly, like Israel becomes a nation of 12 sons and their, their descendants, so uh, Ishmael's family are 12 sons and their descendants. 
Ishmael lived 137 <laughs> years and <clears throat> breathed his last and died and was gathered to his people. Hi, Ed. Hello, everybody. Uh, his descendants settled in the area from Havilah to Shur, which if you knew the map well, you could figure out where that is, but I don't think it makes that much difference to us. It's down toward Egypt, south of, um, south and perhaps a little west of where Abraham and Isaac are. They lived in hostility toward all their brothers. Uh, the prophecy about Ishmael said he would live in hostility toward his brothers, and now the writer says he did that. Okay, now we leave Ishmael. We're not that concerned about him. But we go to back to Isaac and Rebekah. Uh, and this is account, the account. Here's another one of these. This is the account of Abraham's son, Isaac. Abraham became the father of Isaac, and Isaac was 40 years old when he married Rebekah, daughter of Bethuel, the Aramean. Uh, Aram is generally the geography, the land up north of of uh, along the headwaters of, of the Tigris and Euphrates, <clears throat> and, and his, a sister of Laban, the Aramean. Uh, Padan Aram is uh, one of the names for this area, and uh, that be basically means the plain of Aram, and Aram is one is an ancient person that this was named after. <clears throat> so. Isaac prayed to the Lord on behalf of his wife because she was barren. They'd been married 20 years and there was no child and having a child is pretty important to them. The Lord answered his prayer. Oh boy, did he. And the wife, Rebecca, became pregnant. <clears throat> the babies jostled each other within her. And she said, why is this happening to me? So she went to inquire of the Lord. Okay, Lord, you gave me a baby, but what's this going on within me? Yeah, she couldn't go to her doctor and get a diet and understand that it was actually twins. But so <clears throat> the Lord said to her, "Now, I, I, she's part of this family, so it's not." And Isaac has already gone and talked to the Lord on her behalf, so she's not shocked that the Lord talks to her. Two nations are in your womb, and two peoples are within, within you will be separated. One people will be stronger than the other, and the older will serve the younger. Now, this is going to puzzle us a little bit because it looks like Jacob and his mother kind of contrived to make it come out that way, and yet God has already said that's the way it would come out. <clears throat> when the time came for her to give birth, there were twin boys in her womb. <clears throat> the first to come out was red, and his whole body was like a hairy garment. I, newborn babies are pretty nice looking usually, but this doesn't sound very appealing. But anyway, um, uh, he, he, had, he was a very hairy baby, and so they named him Esau, which I would gather has something to do with being hairy, though I don't find my sources explaining that too much. Esau may mean hairy, but later then he's called Edom, and Edom means red. So we'll, we'll see how, where that comes from. He, it says that he was red as well as hairy when he was born. After that, his brother came out with his hand grasping Esau's heel. Uh, that sounds a little odd, and yet I guess it's a divine thing. I guess there's something happening here. So they have this way of naming children by, by significant things. So he was named Jacob. Now, Jacob literally means a heel grabber, but to them, a heel grabber apparently was, this was kind of a euphemism for somebody who was kind of underhanded less than really uh, straightforward and honest. Isaac was 60 years old when Rebecca gave birth to them. So he was 40 years old when they were married and now he's 60 years old and they have the twins. The boys grew up. Now here we have a, an interesting case of uh, maybe how not to raise uh, a family. <clears throat> okay. 
Esau became a skillful hunter, uh, a man of the open country, while Jacob was a quiet man staying among the tents, apparently learning to cook a little from his mother and probably learning to read and be involved in things early. Uh, so Isaac, who had a taste for wild game, loved Esau, but Rebekah loved Jacob. So you got twin boys and dad likes one of them. He's the rugged outdoorsman and he brings me deer and whatever else he catches out there. And, 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 I, and Jacob, well, he's, just, he's a mama's boy. He sits around the tent, so I don't really feel for it. But, but his mother uh, says, this is my boy. He's right here with me. Once when Jacob was cooking some stew, now this is the familiar story. Esau came in from the open, open country famished. I don't think the text intends to tell us that he was at the verge of starvation and if he didn't get a bite to eat, he would just fall over dead. But Esau being the kind of guy he was is very dramatic about such a thing. He said to Jacob, quick, let me have some of that red stew. I'm famished. That is why he was called Edom, it says, red, because of the red stew. Jacob replied, first sell me your birthright. Look, I'm about to die, he said. What do I care about a birthright? Uh, what good is a birthright to me? But Jacob said, swear to me first. So he swore an oath to him, selling his birthright to Jacob. Then Jacob gave Esau some bread and some lentil stew. Uh, lentil is a kind of bean, isn't it? Yeah. So some have said, well, this is sort of an old day's chili or whatever that he was making. <laughs> he ate and drank and got up and left. So Esau despised his birthright. Okay. I guess what we are supposed to see in this is that God knew the disposition of these two boys. Uh, you'll find in the book of Romans that Paul uses this as a point to make that God has a right to choose. And if God chooses, we don't have a right to complain. So he says God chose uh, Jacob and, and refused Esau. It says, es Jacob I love, but Esau I hated. This is this overuse of too much uh, dramatic stuff there. He, he uh, said, I, I'm not going to give this continuing covenant relationship to Esau and his family. Now we'll see a little bit more why that is, other than the fact that Esau had no interest in this. He, he didn't care about the, the birthright and the relationship with God, apparently. Now there was a famine in the land, beside the earlier famine of Abraham's time, and Isaac went down to the same king, though it may be the king's son, Abimelech may be like Pharaoh, a title that passes from one to another, or maybe the son is named after the father, but uh, it may not be the exact same fellow that uh, Abraham went to. So, <clears throat> uh, and again, it says the Philistines, but my footnotes and my, my uh, archaeologists say, no, the, the Philistines came to this land later. They were seafaring people. But uh, you find in Genesis, and this may confuse you at times, you find times where it talks about something and then later you see where that someplace was given a name. This is true about Bethel. Uh, it says that Abraham pitched his tent between Bethel and Ai. And yet it's Jacob later who names the place Bethel. But of course the writer is, knows that that's the name of it. So he gives it the name even though it's before it happened. So Isaac went to Abimelech, king of the Philistines in Gerar. The Lord appeared to Isaac. Now, here we are again with the same kind of thing that God is steering. The Lord appeared to Isaac and said, Do not go down to Egypt. Live in the land where I tell you to live. Remember how Abraham was so strong about don't, don't send Isaac up there to find a wife. He won't ever come back. Now God says, don't even go down to Egypt. Uh, stay here. So he stays in the land with the neighboring, more, probably the most powerful uh, city-state king in the area. 
So <clears throat> he says, I will bless you for to you and your descendants, I will give all these lands. This is the same blessing that we heard several times to Abraham. Now he gives exactly the same blessing to Isaac. I will give all these lands and will confirm the oath I swore to your father Abraham. I will make your descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky and will give them all these lands. And though your offspring and through your offspring, all nations on earth will be blessed. That's the phrase that really means the most to us. Through your offspring, all the nations of the earth will be blessed. Because Abraham obeyed me and kept my requirements, my commandments, my decrees, and my laws. I find that a very interesting statement. Paul makes the point that you can't charge Abraham with keeping the Mosaic law because he didn't have the Mosaic law. It comes so much later. But here, and I've often wondered, well, okay, what did Abraham have? Here God says that Abraham had, he had given Abraham some instruction and he kept the requirements that God gave him. My commands, my decrees, and my laws. So Isaac stayed in Gerar. When the men of that place asked him about his wife, he said, oh, she's my sister. <laughs> now this is a whole lie because she's his, his uh, cousin, but she's not his sister. And because he was afraid to say she is my wife, he thought, I wonder where he got this. Maybe he got it from his father. <laughs> the men of this place might kill me on account of Rebecca because she is beautiful. Man, this must have been a, a family of beautiful women. Now, I love this. When Isaac had been there a long time, Abimelech, king of the Philistines, looked down from a window and saw Isaac caressing his wife, Rebecca. King James says, sporting with his wife. <laughs> okay, you can figure out what this means. Uh, but anyway, it's something that a guy would do with his wife, but he wouldn't do with his sister. <laughs> uh, caressing his wife, Rebecca. So Abimelech summoned Isaac and said, she's really your wife. Uh, why did you say she's my sister? And same answer, Isaac said, because I thought I might lose my life on account of her. Then Abimelech said, what is this you've done to us? One of the men might have slept with your wife and you would have brought guilt upon us. So somewhere in these rules that not only Abraham has, but others have, there's a rule about adultery. And notice here, uh, one of the things about following the patriarchs that the uh, Mormon church got into early on, and there's still Mormons who do this, was this plural marriage, uh, having a, a bunch of wives. But Rebecca is the only wife of Isaac, so you can't say that all of those patriarchs had plural wives. So uh, anyway, <clears throat> and it seems that this relationship between Isaac and Rebecca is a very beautiful thing. Uh, very, uh, and God is looking out, out for it. So Abimelech gave orders to all his people, anyone who molests this man or his wife shall surely be put to death. They didn't fool around with their rules. Isaac planted crops in that land. Uh, we don't have much said since way back at the beginning of the book about planting crops, but here it says that Isaac planted crops in the same year reaped a hundredfold. Remember in Jesus' parable about the seeds, the, the seed in the good soil reaps 20, 60, a hundredfold. So a hundredfold, he had a great harvest. Because the Lord blessed him, the man became rich and his wealth continued to grow until he became very wealthy. He had so many flocks and herds and servants and the Philistines envied him. So all the wells that his father's servants had dug in the time of his father Abraham, the Philistines stopped up, filling them with earth. This is kind of a strange thing. They, when they go someplace new for pastures, they dig a well. The water must not have been too far underground for them to just dig and find water. So they had a, a small well. Some of these were deep wells that uh, had been there for a long time, but... <clears throat> but then this kind of competition between the uh, uh, Abimelech's people and, and Abraham first and then Isaac 
uh, Abraham's servants dug wells here and there, and and the uh, Philistines, it says, the, the people with Abimelech came and filled the wells in. Uh, when Abimelech, then Abimelech said to Isaac, move away from us, you've become too powerful for us. Uh, too powerful? Well, I think, uh, I think this gets explained. So Isaac moved away from there and encamped in the valley of Gerar and settled there. Isaac reopened the wells that had been dug in the time of his father Abraham. I remember a devotional book that I read many years ago that talked about reopening the wells. Sometimes in your early Christian life, you, you find some strong devotional material that's very helpful and then you go on and, and uh, you sort of get bogged down and, he's, and this author was saying, go back and reopen the wells. Uh, start back where you were. So Isaac, you see Isaac as a man of peace and patience in this. Uh, he, reop he reopened the wells that had been dug in the time of his father Abraham. When the Philistines had, st which the Philistines had stopped up after Abraham died, and he gave them the same names his father had given them. Isaac's ser servants dug in the valley and discovered a well of fresh water there. But the herdsmen of Gerar quarreled. They said, this is our water. This is not your water. They realized that you could dig a well here and a well there, and it was the same water. So this is our water. So uh, the water is ours. So he named the well Bezek, which means controversy, uh, because they disputed, means disputed, because they disputed with him. Then they dug another well, but they came and quarreled about that one also, so he named it <laughs> Sitna, which means quarrelsome, and moved on from there and dug another well, and no one quarreled over it. He named it Rehoboth, which means space, uh, means we've, we've got space to live now, saying, now the Lord has given us room and we will flourish in the land. From there he went up to Beersheba. Now Beersheba is one of the long-standing, really well-established uh, wells. That night the Lord appeared to him and said, I am the God of your father Abraham. Do not be afraid. Uh, interesting that they have kind of the same thing that Abraham, I think when he came up from Egypt, God said, I, you don't need to be afraid. You don't need to do the kind of thing you did of, being afraid for your life because I'm taking care of you. For I am with you. I will bless you and will increase the number of your descendants for the sake of my servant Abraham. Isaac built an altar there and called on the name of the Lord. There he pitched his tent and there his servants dug a well. Uh, again, I don't know whether this building an altar is a matter of offering animal sacrifices, possibly so. But in any way, there was some kind of a ritual of worship that they did in building an altar and then worshiping God. Meanwhile, Abimelech had come to him from Gerar with Azuroth, his personal advisor, and Philcol. Now, that's the same name we had before, of the, his commander of the army. So maybe they are, this is the same Abimelech. Isaac asked them, why have you come to me since you were hostile to me and sent me away? Here you are coming to visit me, but you told me I, you didn't want me in your land, get out. Uh, they answered, we saw clearly that the Lord was with you. And interesting, they used this same personal name of God, according to the text, that the Lord was with you. So we said, there ought to be a sworn agreement between us, between us and you. Let us make a treaty with you that you will do us no harm, just as we did not molest you after treating you well and sent you away in peace. And now you are blessed by the Lord. So the, the neighboring king doesn't take much for him to see that this is God's special person and he wants a, a, a treaty with him. Isaac made them a feast, but then in the morning, uh, they ate and drank early the next morning. 
The men swore an oath to each other. Then Isaac sent them on their way, and they left him in peace. That day Isaac's servants came and told him about the well they had dug, and they said, We found water. And he called it Sheba. That's a word we're familiar with, but I'm not sure that there's any connection. Sheba means uh, uh, an oath. Uh, so it, they seem to be naming it after this covenant or this that they made with the people there. And to this day, the name of the town has been Beersheba. So it seems like now we're establishing that well that's been referred to several times earlier in Beersheba. Uh, they were a source of, so when, <clears throat> when Esau was 40 years old, he married Judith, daughter of Beeri, the Hittite, and also Basimath, daughter of Elon, the Hittite. They were a source of grief to Isaac and Rebekah. Uh, this is not a story that we have to say was, well, you know, this is, we can't identify with this. Uh, so whatever the customs were, whatever the personalities were, uh, Isaac and Rebekah did not get along well with these two daughters-in-law. So, um, now we have the, the great story here that, uh, that you were all familiar with, the, the kind of the bookend to his buying the, the birthright from Jacob, buying it from Esau. When Isaac was old and his eyes were so weak that he could, not, could no longer see, uh, the aging is interesting here that uh, he's, he's an old man now. He still uh, can get around a little bit and he's still alive, but his eyes are failing. Uh, and he can't go to his doctor and have LASIK surgery and fix his <laughs> eyes. So his eyes are so weak he can't see. He's virtually blind, apparently. He called for Esau, his older son, and said to him, my son? And Esau said, here am I. That's the way you answer. Uh, Isaac said, I am now an old man and don't know the way, day of my death. I understand that. Now then, get your weapons, your quiver and bow. Apparently, mainly was a, an archer. Go out to the open country to hunt some wild game for me. Prepare me the kind of tasty food I like. Apparently, Esau knew how to cook uh, game. And bring it to me to eat so that I may give you my blessing before I die. Now, this is continues all the way through Jacob and Joseph, uh, this idea that, of the blessing that's given. And you, you have to conclude in this that, that God is involved in this, that, that there's some kind of inspiration to these blessings. But reading it here, it, it's a little hard to see just how that works. Uh, so, now Rebekah was listening as Isaac spoke to his son Esau. This business of you live in tents, and so you can listen at the tent flap. And so uh, Rebecca's listening as Isaac speaks to his son Esau. When Esau left for the open country to hunt game and bring it back, Rebecca sent for her son Jacob. They had a separate tent, so Jacob's off somewhere. She calls, sends a servant to get him. Look, I overheard your father saying to your brother Esau, Bring me some game and prepare me some tasty food to eat so that I may give you my blessing in the presence of the Lord before I die. Now, my son, listen carefully and do what I tell you. See, we say, well, Jacob is a sneaky guy, he steals his, but actually it was his mother's idea. Um, go out to the flock and bring me two choice young goats, she says. Isaac won't know the difference whether it's wild game or whether it's goat the way I'm going to prepare it for him. So I can prepare some tasty food for your father just the way he likes it. Then take it to your father to eat so that he may give you his blessing before he dies. I don't know whether Rebecca knows about this sale of the birthright. I suppose she does. 
And I suppose that's some justification for her saying, you know, you, the blessing belongs to you. Apparently, Isaac doesn't know about it or didn't take it seriously. So, John, it's not automatic that the oldest one gets the birthright then? It, it's I usual. It was. Yeah, it's usual. And, and yet, again, Paul makes points out that God at several times bypasses that. Mm -hmm. uh, and so when he does bypass it, there's something that we should see there is reason for it. Mm -hmm. Jacob said to Rebekah, his mother, but my brother Esau is a hairy man, and I'm with, I, a man with smooth skin. What if my father touches me? I would appear to be tricking him and would bring down a curse on myself rather than a blessing. <laughs> he says, father may be blind, but he's not dumb. If he touches me, he's going to know it's not Esau. His mother said to him, My son, let the curse fall on me. Just do as what I say. Go and get them for me. So he went and got them and brought them to his mother, and she prepared some tasty food just the way his father liked it. How long it takes them to prepare from a live goat to a meal. But anyway, time is not their problem. Then Rebecca took the best clothes of Esau, her older son, which had, she had in the house, and put them on her younger son, Jacob. She's a pretty clever gal. She also covered his hands and the smooth part of his neck with the goat skins. Then she handed to her son Jacob the tasty food and the bread and she had made. He went to his father and said, My father, yes, my son, he answered, who is it? Jacob said to his father, I am Esau, your firstborn. Uh, I have done as you told me. Please sit up and eat some of my game so that you may give me your blessing. Isaac asked his son, how did you find it so quickly? My son, the Lord your God gave me success, he replied. My Old Testament teacher had trouble with that when he said, you know, it's one thing to lie outright to your father, but to, to claim that it's God's doing. Then Isaac said to Jacob, come near so I can touch you, my son. He, he's not so easily fooled to know whether you really are my son Esau or not. Jacob went close to his father, Isaac, who touched him and said, the voice is the voice of Jacob, but the hands are the hands of Esau. <laughs> Poor old Isaac, he's really, he did not recognize him for his hands were hairy like those of his brother Esau. So he blessed him. Are you really my son Esau? He asked. I am, he replied. One last time, he says, I don't understand this, but Tell me clearly, are you Esau? Yeah. Then he said, my son, bring me some of your game to eat so that I may give you my blessing. I guess the meal together was part of the ceremony of this. Jacob brought to him and he ate and he brought some wine and he drank. And then his father Isaac said to him, come here, my son, and kiss me. So he went to him and kissed him. When Isaac caught the smell of the clothes, he said, oh, it really is Esau. Smells like Esau. <laughs> uh, he blessed him and said, ah, the smell of my son is like the smell of a field that the Lord has blessed. May God give you of heaven's dew and of earth's rich, richness. So he's saying, you're going to be prosperous. This is another one of these things that we have people that we call the prosperity gospel who say, See, if you serve God, you become rich like Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and Joseph. Mm, I don't think so. Um, so it may give you of the earth's richness an abundance of grain and new wine. So apparently regularly they raised grain. May nations serve you and peoples bow down to you. Be Lord over your brothers. Now that's the firstborn. He's the firstborn has the the rule of the family when his father dies. So, you know, John, I wonder if this story is the uh, origin of that saying of the way to a man's heart is through his stomach. Through his stomach. It could be. It <laughs> could be. Story. It seemed to be so with Isaac. Yeah. 
Okay, you know, the prosperity, you know, on that side coming, I mean, the prosperity gospel, it almost seems self contradictory because if you become rich and prosperous, why does the Bible spend so much time talking about the poor and yeah. the, yeah. And the, un, the downtrodden? You yeah. know? I mean, why would you want to be prosperous if the downtrodden are the ones that are Yeah, faith? when we get to the New Testament and even through the Old Testament, so the Psalms speak about God blessing. The widows and the orphans and the right, uh, right. being the helper of the needy. Yeah, I think it was credited to Mark Twain who said, God must love poor people because he made so many of them. <laughs> okay, <clears throat> so be Lord over your brothers and may the sons of your mother bow down to you. Well, now there's only one other son of mother, but this is a standard form kind of blessing. May those who curse you be cursed and those who bless you be blessed. Essentially what God had said to Abraham, those who bless you I will bless and those who curse you I will curse. After Isaac finished blessing him and Jacob had scarcely left his father's presence, his brother Esau came in from hunting. He too prepared some tasty food and brought it to his father. Then he said to him, my father, sit up and eat some of my game so that you may give me your blessing. His father asked him, Who are you? I'm your son, he answered, your firstborn, Esau. Now Esau was very aware that he was the firstborn of the mm -hmm. twins. Uh, Isaac trembled violently and said, Who was it then that hunted game and brought it to me? I ate it just before you came and blessed him, and indeed he will be blessed. I think, well, now wait a minute. If, if Isaac figures that he intends to bless Esau, and Jacob has has uh, stolen the blessing, you'd think he'd say, well, then that blessing doesn't count mm -hmm. because it was a lie, I'll give you the blessing. But no, he says the blessing once given is given, can't be with, taken back. So they had very strong understandings of the significance and, and the way this blessing must be handled. When Esau heard his father's words, he burst out with a loud and bitter cry. Now, as a younger man, he didn't care about any of this, but he cares about it now, uh, and said to his father, bless me, me too, my father. So poor Esau is just, just distraught that he's lost this blessing from his father. But he said, your brother came deceitfully and took your blessing. Esau said, isn't he rightly named Jacob? He has deceived me these two times. I didn't see much deception in the sale thing, uh, yeah. but, but I can see why Esau would rightly feel that, Jake, that, that Jacob had deceived both his brother and his father. He took my birthright and now he's taken my blessing. I would think those two fit together though. Then he asked, haven't you reserved any blessing for me? Isaac answered Esau, I have made him Lord over you and have made all his relatives his servants and I have sustained him with grain and new wine. So what can I possibly do for you, my son? Esau said to my father, do you have only one blessing, my father? Bless me too, my father. Oh, this repeating of my father is interesting. Uh, when es then Esau wept aloud, his father Isaac answered him, your dwelling will be away from the earth's richness. You're going to have a, a tough place to live, away from the dew of heaven above. You will live by the sword and you will serve your brother. But when you grow restless, you will throw his yoke from off your neck. Uh, I'm not sure how to interpret that. I, the, the nations that came from them, the time of David, fought, and David conquered uh, the uh, the conquered Edom, the people that were directly descended from Esau, and made them his servants. But then, when the Babylonians came and, and carried the people from Judah captive, the that freed the people of Edom and they jumped for joy and, and, and uh, the prophets say God was displeased with their being so happy about uh, Israel being overthrown. 
So Esau held a grudge against Jacob because of the blessing his father had given him. He said to himself, the days of mourning for my father are near. He, he's not gonna last much longer. Then I will kill my brother Jacob. I'm not gonna take this, I'm gonna take vengeance. When Rebekah was told what her oldest son, older son Esau had said, mom doesn't miss much that there are those who listen and they run to mom and tell her um, <clears throat> your brother Esau she called Jacob and said your brother Esau is consoling himself with the thought of killing you now then my son do what I say here we are again I, I can fix it do what I say flee at once to my brother Laban in Haran Stay with him for a while until your brother's fury subsides. When your brother is no longer angry with you and forgets what you did to him, I'll send word for you to come back from there. Why should I lose both of you in one day? Not sure. I guess the idea that, that a murderer should be put to death was already there. And if Esau killed Jacob, who, whoever, the others of the household would kill Esau. So he would lose, she would lose both of them. Some say, no, she's talking about Isaac and Jacob. But I, it seems like she's talking about both the boys. So then she goes to Isaac. She's got to manipulate Isaac a little bit here. Then Rebecca said to Isaac, I'm disgusted with living because of these Hittite women. If Jacob takes a wife from among the women of this land, from Hittite women like these, my son, my life will not be worth living. Uh, they had a wonderful, long, happy marriage, and she says to Isaac, now look, uh, you can't let this happen. You can't let Jacob marry one of these women of the land. I've had so much trouble with the two women that Esau married. You've got to do different. So. Isaac said, oh, all right, called Jacob and said, and blessed him and said, uh, do not marry a Canaanite woman. Now, he calls them Canaanites. The text calls them Hittites. I guess they, they were mixed races. Go at once to Padan Aram to the house of your mother's brother, Bethuel. Uh, Bethuel was the father of Rebekah. Uh, take a wife for yourself there from among the daughters of Laban, your mother's brother. May God Almighty bless you and make you fruitful and increase your numbers until you become a community of peoples. May he give you and your descendants the blessings, even to, blessings given to Abraham so that you may take possession of the land where you now live as an alien, the land God gave to Abraham. Then Isaac sent Jacob on his way, and he went to Padan Aram to Laban, son of Bethuel, the Armenian, Aramean, the brother of Rebekah, who was the mother of Jacob and Esau. Details we don't really need, but they repeat them anyway. Now Esau learned that Isaac had blessed Jacob and sent him to Padan Aram, and I'm sure he wasn't happy about that, to take a wife from there and that when he blessed him, he commanded him, do not marry a Canaanite woman. So Esau says, oh, I think I made a mistake in the women I married. <laughs> and that Jacob had obeyed his father and mother and had gone to Padan Aram. Esau then realized how displeasing the Canaanite women were to his father Isaac. So, and he doesn't say anything about his mother. So he went to Ishmael and married Mahalath, the sister of ne Nebaioth and, and daughter of Ishmael, son of Abraham, in addition to the wives he already had. So now he has three wives, but he hopes that maybe by marrying an Ishmaelite rather than a Canaanite, uh, <laughs> that his parents will be happy about that. Okay, we're going to stop there. And next week we begin the stories of Jacob, and the stories of Jacob are so interesting, sometimes so devotional, so beautiful, sometimes so uh, human. Uh, Jacob is much more 
a human kind of guy that does his own thing and you wonder just where is his faith he seems to be struggling with it uh, we'll talk more about that as we look at his stories but we'll start at chat verse 10 of uh, chapter 28 and we'll follow Jacob as he goes on his journey all by himself uh, to now interesting comparing this with the fact that Isaac knew that Abraham had sent a servant to find a but I, I think this is Rebecca's doing, that she says to Isaac, now we got to get him out of here. He's married Jabul. He's going to marry one of these women, and we won't have anything, any way to stop him. So send him away. Now, uh, Abraham was so strong in saying, don't send Isaac uh, away there. But Isaac doesn't see the same thing. He says, no, send Jacob away. Uh, and it, 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 of course, Rebecca wants it that way because she doesn't want Esau to kill him. So anyway, very interesting stories, stories that uh, we can identify with. And it does make us kind of puzzled and say, these are the people that God is blessing. Uh, considered, considering all that's involved, uh, they, they seem to be the best that God would have to work with. And uh, Isaac does seem like a good fellow. I, I like Isaac from what I see of him. I feel sorry for him when he's old and blind and he's, he says, realizes somebody's pulling fast on him, but he says, I uh, guess it's the way it is. It sounds like Jacob, but I must be mistaken. So, okay, any uh, discussion, questions, thoughts? So we wrap up. You know, the thing that uh, strikes me about it is, he says, you know, you're not the commands, you're not supposed to lie or whatever. Mm -hmm. And here's total deceit, mm -hmm. and yet God honors that deceit. That's uh, rather than punishing. That, that seems strange, doesn't it? It Given does. That he punishes, destroys whole towns or whatever. Yeah. When he gets yeah. <laughs> seems yeah. like the ends justify the means somehow. Mm -hmm. You know, that yeah. because God wanted him to be blessed in the first place, then it's okay that he did this deceit to get it, yeah. which goes against what we kind of feel. Yeah, that's that's kind of what struck me the first time I was studying this. I thought, whoa, is really? And, and then I thought, no, but before the boys were born, yeah. God said that Jacob should yeah. be the yeah. one to yeah. continue the, the covenant, that the older should serve the younger. So it just fulfilled, but there's kind of a difficulty there. It carries down the ages, and then we come to Judas, and we say, well, Judas had to betray Jesus because it was prophesied that he would. Well, God's foreknowledge and his, his uh, uh, order of things is not always, I mean, he, he orders things according to his foreknowledge. But uh, so I can see why he picked Jacob rather than Esau because of the way their lives unfold. Uh, that's my prejudice is because I'm more like Jacob than I would be like Esau. <laughs> but um, I do think that, that uh, the, the, the lie and the deception come back. Uh, it's interesting how God shows later sometimes that he disapproved of something that it was his will it be that way but it wasn't his will it be gotten that way i had to think well if if rebecca had not taken upon herself to to program this god would have found a way to to take care of it which comes to me as a kind of a personal thing don't don't figure that you you know what god would want so you can fix it. Okay, God, I got this. You know, <laughs> not a good idea. Okay, any uh, any further thought along that line? Uh, it it gets worse before it gets better in terms of uh, of the the what what we're seeing is what they do and in a way supposedly get away with, and yet sometimes there's there's repercussions for what they do and yet it, it comes out all right in the end. You know the other piece that strikes me about the story is Rebecca has got to be one strong will. Oh yeah. The bird say, well let the curse be on me. I mean, 
Yes. Yeah. Oh yeah. Who wants to say, well, God cursed me? I mean, that's yeah. a, that, that's a pretty strong saying. You want what you want so badly, that guy cursed me if, you know, if there's a curse on it? This is the same gal who said, let me uh, take a, give you a drink and then I'll water all your camels. You know, yeah. she's a strong woman. She may be a very beautiful woman, but she's a very strong-minded woman, used to doing what she thinks best and having it work out. Uh, and of course, the relationship between Isaac and Rebecca, you think um, she should be just really tender toward Isaac in his mm -hmm. time of being blind, but she doesn't seem to feel that, that we would feel that she's mistreating her husband in setting this up. Uh, but She's not, too much of a doting mother and that's her problem. Well, I yeah. was going to say, never underestimate yeah. the love of a mother for yeah. her son. Uh, <laughs> the, the helicopter mother, she's watching out for Jacob every step <laughs> yeah. of the way. Yeah. Well, and I do think that, that we can learn some wrong things that don't work rightly when we read the mm -hmm. Old Testament stories. When you talk about the idea of the plural wives, you think, oh, that was the, the way it should be. If you follow that story down through, you know, David had several wives. And the, the biggest problem to him was having those several wives and those children that were mm -hmm. half brother and sister. One of the half brothers rapes one of the of his half sisters. And then that sister's brother Absalom kills him. And then Absalom attempts to take the kingdom away from his father. And you say, eh, how come God went for, for the child of, that came from this marriage that was so wrong to begin with to be king? But given what he had to choose from, maybe Solomon was the best choice. So, But anyway, I, I can't see that, uh, uh, that even through the Old Testament, yeah, polygamy still is there a little bit. You get down deep into the Old Testament stories and you have Hannah, who's, there are two wives and the one wife has children and the other one doesn't. Uh, but basically it seems to go away then. We don't seem to have reference later in about, well, of course, Solomon had all of his concubines but uh, we, and then when you get to the New Testament, there doesn't seem to be any reference to polygamy. When Paul talks about church leaders, he says the husband of one wife. So apparently by that time, it's been settled in the minds of even the Jewish leaders that marriage is a, a one man, one woman thing. Okay, uh, we better close, give you some time for refreshments. So let's close in prayer. Father, we just thank you for your word. We thank you for its puzzles that give us cause to search carefully and to think things through. We ask that you would guide us and guard us from the errors of our, of our ways of thinking and help us to see that all of this is the unfolding of your plan that will finally come to full fruition when your son comes into the world. So we thank you. We pray for those of our friends and family who have special needs today, that you would touch them with your special strength and peace today. In Jesus' name, amen. amen.